Hi there, welcome back to our online service and for our time of praying together in this service, I'm just going to be looking at two verses in Mark chapter 1. From verse 16, it says here, Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he, Jesus, saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Now Jesus was passing along this place, the Sea of Galilee, and he saw these two, two guys, fishermen, uh, well, uh, casting their net into the sea. And then verse 17, it says, Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now, you know, me being someone that's familiar with these passages and I, I will come across this and I have no questions about this when Jesus asked these two guys to follow him and then they immediately respond by saying, hey, I'm going to leave all my stuff behind and follow Jesus. There was, I mean, I have no questions until a guy that I'm meeting with and just discipling, he asked me this question. Why would these two guys just leave their nets and follow Jesus? I paused for a moment and I thought, yeah, it's a good question. Why would they do it? Why would you do it? Well, sometimes if you come to a passage and you are wondering, hey, what's going on here? It might be good to find all the other places whereby potentially this same account is mentioned. And if you look at the account in Luke chapter 5, it will tell us this, that these two guys, they were fishing. They fished all night. They caught nothing. And then Jesus comes and says that, hey, go cast your net, right? Go and fish again. And these guys are fishermen and their response was this, okay, uh, actually we caught nothing, but since you say so, we're just going to do it. And when they did so, they had such a large catch of fish uh, that they, they had even struggled pulling it in, which means they had an encounter with God, simply put. And that is the reason why, if you read this account, that these two men are able to respond by saying, I'm going to follow Jesus question for us, all of us, if you're listening, we're going to pray in a moment that I'm sure if you're following us on our service, that probably you had an encounter with Jesus before, right? That Jesus came in a way whereby he met you at your point of need. He gave you an answer. He gave you encouragement. He gave you strength, right? You had an encounter just like this man. And now if Jesus were to say, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, what would your response be? Would it be like this man who literally put everything else as secondary, they left it behind, and followed Jesus wholeheartedly? As we go into our time of prayer, let this be the thought that you will reflect upon that will you follow Jesus wholeheartedly? Is there something that maybe you might be holding on to that may be holding you back from following Him fully? Father, I pray even today as we begin our time together, at this service, that Lord, that we will all respond to your call over our lives to follow you, to follow you. And as we follow you, Simon and Andrew has a specific call that Jesus, you're going to make them fishers of men. And I believe likewise, you have a call for all of our lives, even as we follow you. And I pray that Lord, give us the faith, the grace to leave the things behind that may hold us back from following you wholeheartedly. So Lord, we just thank you for this time. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Death cannot keep you in the grave. You have overcome the world. You took all sin and shame away. You have overcome the world, you're coming back again one day. You will overcome the world, overcome the world. King Jesus, you're victorious. All of heaven roars, your glory, yes, you are Lord of all. We shout your name, Jesus, you are God, you forever Overcome the world, I know you're coming back for me. 
You will overcome the world, overcome the world. King Jesus, you're victorious. All of heaven roars, you're glorious. You are Lord of all. We shout your name, Jesus, you are God. Forever Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that you've given us to know you and also to follow you. And Lord, this is a privilege even to bring our worship to you. And Father, we just give you thanks in Jesus' name. If you'd like to just to continue to give and to worship God with your tithe and offering, you can get onto our website and you can find the details there. Well, now I'm going to hand over the time to Pastor Joey for the time of meditation upon the Word of God. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Meditating on the Word of God. And as you know, we are in the month of April, and this is our final piece on a four-part series on the way of the cross, the journey of Jesus onto Calvary and the resurrection. As you know, April is the uh, fourth month of the year, and literally hard to imagine that uh, uh, 25% of the year is gone. And, and as we move forward, I want to do a quick review of the messages that have been delivered in this process into the garden. A look into the first place we find Jesus in his journey to the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane. Crossroads, where we find him in Calvary on the cross. Crossovers, where we find three sets of people, different people who crossed over to the way of life that Jesus intended for them. Today, I've entitled this message, Crossways, or a play on words to talk about what it means for the way of the cross. The final place that I want to talk to you about is the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee, in, 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 uh, I've, I've personally been there on four separate occasions in various times and seasons. And to understand the significance of the resurrection, we need to go back to the, to the Sea of Galilee at the place of calling. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, we find that Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Notice the words, Jesus was walking by the sea beside the Sea of Galilee. And this is the first place where he meets Peter and his brother Andrew. Now, I want to take note of something that's very interesting here. It says that they were casting a net by the lake. (laughs) 
which is interesting. I thought you said it was the Sea of Galilee, but now you're saying it's a lake. Well, let me explain. Actually, the Sea of Galilee is really not a sea, but traditionally is known as the Sea of Galilee because of the region and the size of this lake. The region was Galilee, and the size of this lake took on the traditional word Sea of Galilee for its size and regional location. But it's also known to the Romans as the Lake of Tiberias. And finally, it is known in the Old Testament name, Lake Genesaret. So we are reading the Bible, just a point of interest. Take note that when you see these three phrases, they actually are referring to the same place. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19 and 20, Jesus calls out to Peter and Andrew and says, Come follow me. This is the first calling, and I will send you out to fish for people. And once at once they left their nets and followed him. It was the place of calling. It was the place of promise. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, it continues, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. It was the place of promise. Once upon a time, they were just fishermen, and all of a sudden, they find themselves proclaiming one of the most important things and watching people get healed of sickness and disease. Further, in the next part of this, verse 24, it says, News about him spread all over Syria, and the, and the people brought to him all who were ill and with various diseases. Those suffering were from severe pain, demon-possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. This was not just the place of calling and the place of promise. It was the place of excitement, exciting. to Imagine two fishermen, now all of a sudden, their entire lives are changed. They've been called by no less than God, the Messiah. They're now in a place, it's a promising career that was full of excitement. And further in verse 25, it says, large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. It didn't say crowds. It said large crowds. All of a sudden, there's this magnitude, the significance of, the, of what they were doing. It doesn't say it was just from Galilee. It affected the Decapolis. The word Decapolis, police meaning cities, deca means ten. It affected ten cities. These were Hellenistic cities that were filled with Greeks, but because of the popularity of what they were doing, it affected not just the Decapolis, but Jerusalem, Judea, and across the Jordan followed him. It was the place of calling, the place of promise, the place of excitement, and the place of glory. Meanwhile, back in the Sea of Galilee, this time after Jesus was crucified, we see a different place as we find it in John chapter 21, verse, uh, verse 1. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. Now remember, that Jesus had already appeared to them previously, but now he appears to them again, this time by the Sea of Galilee as the resurrected Christ. And it says it happened this way. We find again Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. This we find Peter once again. Now, it's interesting that while Peter was in the room where he saw Jesus resurrected, he was not quite the same because he failed like he was a failure when he failed to fulfill his promises to Jesus. The loss of excitement, the loss of significance and glory has all ebbed away. He simply was back where he started just wanting to be just another fisherman. The same place, same job, same thing. And this is now the place of failure, the place of broken promises. When Jesus in the Last Supper predicted that they were going to deny him, Mark chapter 14, verse 27 says, You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And he says, you will all fall away. Right after that, in verse 28, he says, But once I've risen, the resurrection, which is this moment here, I will go ahead of you, of you into Galilee. He was actually predicting what was going to happen when he is restored in the resurrected life. Notice what happens in verse 29, where Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not fall away. Jesus kind of corrects him in verse 30, where he says, truly I tell you, Jesus answered today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. And here, but Peter, 
insisted emphatically and said, even if I die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same thing. The place of failure is the place of broken promises. It is also the place of circling back. The excitement is no longer there. Now they're circling back to where he began. Peter is back again as a fisherman. Imagine how it feels to have that place of excitement, to be called by God, to see good, great things happen before you, for your life to be transformed, to see all the significance and the glory and the weight of the thing that you were doing, and you're back from where you started. And then it says in John chapter 21, verse 3, I'm just going to go out and fish again, <laughs> Peter told his co-disciples. And they said, we'll also go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. It's funny and interesting that even the very thing that they knew how to do was now something that wasn't even working. <laughs> In other words, they already lost the old calling. They already lost the old thing that God was making them do. And even now the thing that they're used to do is not even working. The Sea of Galilee is the place of failure, the place of broken promises, the place of circling back to zero, and the place of frustration. You might be thinking about this, and you might be in that place, the place of frustration. Where is my life going? What is in store for the future? It's going to happen. What are my chances? Why am I even on this earth? This is really where the people of God were at this point, which brings us to my third and final point, and finally summary of this message, this four-part message the place of restoration. Jesus restores our ability to succeed. Notice in John chapter 21, verses 4 and 5, it says, Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but again, the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. It's probably because it was early in the morning, and that's why they did not recognize him at that point, because it was still dark. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. It says, he said to them, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because, the, because, the large number of fish, because of the large number of fish. Notice where Jesus actually tells them, here's what you need to do. And as a result of that, they find success. Like Peter, Jesus beats us at our broken promises and failures and our frustrations and helps us Get back to the place where we can find success again. Jesus is the place who restores our ability to succeed once again. When we realize that we are in a dark place, God opens a way for us. I was again I was telling you last week about my friends and I reminded of them because I just went out on a walk with, with one of them and I've just been talking to them about how Jesus opens doors for us challenges that we find in COVID, and yet be, being believers, we can believe that Jesus can grant us success in the midst of that. In cha John chapter 21, verse 7, it says, Then the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. The, 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 Peter was now told that this is actually Jesus that was talking to them. As soon as Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him and jumped into the water. Once again, because of the success that they've seen, Peter realizes that it was Jesus. And once again, that spark, that hope, that, that, that ability to once again believe was resuscitated, resurrected in the life of Peter. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning, coals, there were fish on it, and some bread. When they had finished eating, Jesus zeroed in on Simon Peter. And he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Jesus was restoring the relationship with Peter. Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And here we find Jesus not only restored his ability to succeed, but he was restoring his relationship with Peter. Peter, who had denied him three times, and that's why Jesus was restoring him and asking him the same question three times. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. This is again the second time that Jesus asks him. He wasn't trying to insult him. 
He was trying to restore him. He was trying to show him that the very thing that you failed to do is the very thing I'm restoring in you and for you. And John and, and, and Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you do know that I love you. And Jesus says, take care of my sheep. And finally, a third time, Jesus asks him and said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? At this point, Simon, or, or Peter rather, uh, was hurt because of Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? Fact of the matter is sometimes as God restores us, it's not because he wants to hurt us. He wants us to overcome the very thing that we will fail to do for him. He said, Lord, you know that all things, you know that I love you. The place of restoration is also the Sea of Galilee. If Jesus restores our ability to succeed. He restores our, our, our relationship with him. And as a result of that, Jesus then is able to restore our calling in him. You will notice that every question was followed by feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, because God or Jesus was not just trying to restore the relationship, but restoring the very calling and destiny of Peter. John chapter 21 verse 17 says, Peter was hurt, but you see, God wanted to restore his calling in him. And so he said, feed my sheep. In verse 18, it says, very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. This verse is interestingly defined in the next one. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is really Jesus fulfilling the very destiny and allowing Peter to glorify him. Jesus restores us, not just in our ability to succeed in our life here today. He restores our relationship with him through his resurrected life and restores our calling in him. The Garden of the Sea of Galilee, rather, is the place of calling. It was also the place of failure, but it's also God's way of telling us our place of calling and failure is also the place of our restoration. Let me summarize this message for you. The place of calling is the place of our promises, the place of our excitement, and the place of where we can glorify God. The place of failure is the place of our broken promises, the place of circling back to zero or to nothing, and finally the place of frustration. But it can also very well be the place of restoration, the resurrection power of God to resurrect our failures, our failed promises, and our ability to bring Him glory. Jesus restores our ability to succeed. Jesus restores our relationship with Him. And Jesus restores our calling into Him. Let me help join me with a quick word of prayer as we proclaim Jesus, our Savior. Pick up a piece of bread and a cup and pray this prayer with me. Jesus, our God, Savior, and King, we worship you. We thank you for calling us into a relationship with you. When we find ourselves in a place of failure, we look to you as the one who resurrects our failures, our setbacks, and even our frustrations. In you, we find restoration in our ability to succeed, in our relationship with you, and in our calling to bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, Amen.
up my own for you and you alone for your sacrifice I'm laying down my life I'm giving up my all for you and you alone for your sacrifice I'm laying down my life the price you paid the life you gave the cross and the grave my sins now erase the price you paid the life you gave the cross and the grave all of my sins now Thank you, Lord Jesus, that there is a place whereby we will receive your call, the call over our lives, and we recognize that you have a plan and a purpose for all of our lives. And the times whereby we felt the challenges, the failure, Lord, I pray for the restoration to come, that you restore us, you restore and re renew us, renew our faith, that we will continue to pursue the call, the purpose that you have for all of us. In Jesus' name. Well, God bless you. Hope you have a great service and have a blessed week ahead. Lift you up